Hello and welcome to News Click. I have with me today former National Security Advisor Shiv Shankar Menon. And we're going to ask him a number of questions about what has been happening in Ladakh. Thank you, Mr. Menon, for giving the viewers of News Click your time. Thank you for asking me. Okay. Now, I've been reading some of your interviews. You were uh, India's envoy to China between 2000 and 2003. But while you were with the Ministry of External Affairs between 1992 and 1995, when uh, India's Prime Minister was Mr. Narasimha Rao, you negotiated the first boundary-related agreement between India and China, which was in a sense the root of subsequent agreements and by and large there was peace on the board and there were maybe a few minor issues but nothing major. You were also, when Dr. Manmohan Singh was the Prime Minister of India, you were a special representative on the boundary issue between 2010 and 2014. And, and over the years, I mean all the way from 1974 onwards you've been closely working on this whole issue with the government, of course, uh, on the India-China boundary as well as India-China relations. Now, uh, the differences that India has had on the line of control goes back almost eight decades. You know, uh, We had a war in 62. Uh, For more than 70 years, India and China haven't been able to agree on a fully demarcated border, uh, unlike the line of control with Pakistan. Now, the question that I have for you is what has changed? What has changed that you today assert that India-China relations will have to be reset? And we cannot go back to the situation that prevailed earlier. And what do you understand and would you like to explain? What do you mean by relations between the two most populous countries on the planet, that these need to be reset? Well, the reasons, I mean, there's three big reasons why I think our relations with China need to be reset. And why I think what happened in Ladakh this spring is a symptom of the need to reset the relationship. Because We've, as you said, we've had almost 40 years of relative peace. The border has stayed exactly as it was, uh, by and large. And uh, the relationship has been calm, if not very warm, but at least steady, uh, until recently, until a few years ago. And, but the reason I think today we're in a different situation is because India has changed. China has changed, and so has the environment in which we operate. When we did the basic framework, which or the modus vivendi, which which guided the relationship for the last 30 plus years, and formalized it during the Rajiv Gandhi visit in 1988 to China, uh, at that time, India and China had roughly equal GDPs. We were coming to the end of the Cold War, Soviet Union was about to collapse. China was in internal stress. Tiananmen happened six months after the Rajiv Gandhi visit to China. Uh, And uh, this was the US's unipolar moment was clearly upon us. Both countries, India too, was going through a transition. We were trying to reform. Radical reform happened in 91 as a result of the crisis. But we had already started trying to change our economic course. It was clear that we were trying to increase our international options, uh, not just with China. Rajiv Gandhi went and visited Pakistan later that month in December 88. Uh, But since then, both countries have grown. China has grown faster than India. Today, the Chinese economy is more than four times bigger than ours. China is an economic superpower. Militarily, she's a regional power. She's invested very heavily in developing that military capability. And today, actually, it's also a very different China. Deng Xiaoping's China in in the 80s, 90s, 
and the first part of the first five years or so of the century was a China which concentrated on its own internal economic development, almost to the exclusion of everything else. Politics, everything was subordinate to that economic development. That is no longer the case. Reform in China has actually stalled since 2013. Uh, and today there's a whole different environment. Deng Xiaoping's China was a China which worked very closely with the U.S. Uh, no longer today. Today, the U.S. is pushing back at China's rise, and China-U.S. relations are much more contentious. Uh, our interests have grown. In 1991, when we started reform, most of our foreign trade, which and external merchandise trade, accounted for only about 15.3% of our GDP in 91, and most of that went west through Suez. Whereas by 2014, external merchandise trade was something like 49.6% of GDP. That's almost half our GDP. Half our GDP. And, and or a little less than 40% of that went east through the South China Sea. So suddenly now, freedom of navigation in the South China Sea becomes an Indian interest, becomes a significant Indian interest. In the same period, China is defining that South China Sea as their territorial sea and is building, is militarizing it, building bases, claiming it's a core interest. So we're rubbing up against each other in ways that we never did before. So therefore I say, because India has changed, China has changed, and the situation in which we are has changed completely, uh, I think we do need to reset the relationship. All right. Uh, Mr. Menon, if we, looking at the big picture, the bigger global geopolitical picture, you know, these words, these phrases, their, their implications, you know, about India being part of the Quad together with Japan and with uh, Australia, the word non-alignment, what it meant then? You yourself have talked about non-alignment version two. The question is, does an overtly pro-American stance that India adopts against China, does it diminish or even destroy our strategic autonomy? Rightly or wrongly, China perceives that India is today more pro-United States, perhaps, than before. And so if you look at the bigger kind of a political picture, what has really changed that has led to what we've seen, the denouement that we see in the, to the wire, you've said this is not comparable to 2013 or to, to 1986. That is Sumdurong Chu or Depsang. But what you've seen is multiple in inc incidents, multiple moves uh, forward with China occupying spaces which she had never occupied before along the line of actual control. And for you, it is worrying. This guy is, very, according to you, this is very different Chinese behavior. I mean, what do you think has changed? Because we are today seeing for the first time, we had a face-off on the 5th and 6th of May. Then we had the core commanders meeting on the 6th of June. But 20 Indian soldiers were killed, including a commanding officer, Santosh Babu. We do not know how many Chinese were killed. The Chinese, or at least Global Times, say we don't want to talk about winners and losers. But what really has changed that has led to the current face-off? But I think it's clear that Chinese behavior on the border has changed. Uh, we can only s speculate about Chinese motives. I mean, you've listed all the ways in which their behavior has changed. After all, somebody, Indian soldiers being killed on the border, this last happened in 1975, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This push to try and change the LAC. I said try. Now, Frankly, nobody actually knows the real situation because we have inspired leaks and all kinds of interpretations of satellite pictures and so on. But authoritatively, neither the government of India nor the government of China has actually said what the real situation is on the LAC in, in the Western sector. 
both sides say they have not crossed the LAC, but we know they have differences in perception of where the LAC is. But Chinese behavior has changed. Now, when we try and speculate on the reasons, uh, for me, there's several explanations that are offered in India, which I find unconvincing. People in India say it's what the government of India did in Kashmir, changing the status of Ladakh, etc., last August. Uh, let but me, frankly, only, only Indians offer that explanation. No Chinese let, ever let do me, that. Let me interrupt. Just, you just mentioned the U.S. Yeah, let me just go through the list of... Okay. Uh, you mentioned but, 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 the U.S. On, on India, the U.S. Kashmir, I want to interrupt you. Yeah. Because what happened is that we had a home minister in parliament saying we will take back every square inch of territory from Pakistan and China. Now... September 2009, the writing down of Article 370, Jammu and Kashmir state becoming two union territories. Now, are these, I mean, if our home minister thought this was meant for a domestic audience, no, certainly there were certain international ramifications. Yes, sir. Please continue. Certainly there are international ramifications. Chinese reacted to it. They took the issue to the Security Council. They tried again after that to do it. All that is true. But does it explain the change in behavior on the LAC? No. Even the Chinese don't offer that as an explanation. And frankly, I don't see the connection. You make statements, Chinese made statements, Chinese tried to raise the issue in the Security Council, they dealt with that separately. The other explanation that we hear very often is what you just said. Oh, it's because of India's increasing closeness with the US. But surely this kind of pressure on the LAC, and the Chinese know this, would only guarantee more of the same it actually pushes India into working even more closely with the US. So surely pushing on the LAC is not the answer to India's closeness with the US. Uh, so for me, these are not sufficient explanations, nor is the limited tactical gains on the ground in Ladakh that China may or may not have achieved through this push. Uh, that, I don't think, explains it. So then you are left with much larger explanations. You are left with either Chinese hubris, overconfidence. They think this is a moment when they can achieve what they want. They see a world and India reeling under a pandemic, and they think this is a time where they have come out of it first. Maybe this is an opportunity. Or the opposite that China, like everybody else, is in crisis. And therefore, there is no question that she needs an external distraction. And this offers itself. If you look at Chinese behavior since the COVID pandemic started, China has pushed forward, whether on Hong Kong, by passing a security law on her own, without consulting anybody in Hong Kong, She's pushed forward. She's much more assertive in her behavior in Taiwan, in the Taiwan Strait, in the South China Sea, East China Sea, and now on our border. So it seems to be part of a larger pattern of Chinese behavior. But it, frankly, we are still looking for a proper explanation. And, you know, this is a question of reading the tea leaves, of trying to understand why China has done this. Uh, uh, but I don't think that, frankly, what we may or may not do in the Quad, if anything, what China has done in Ladakh means that the Quad is likely to be more active and is likely to be activated further. Uh, and I'm sure the Chinese could see that for themselves, but they probably calculated that as well. Mr. Menon, you know, both sides, India, China, have built, have constructed uh, infrastructural projects in areas where the LSE was never ever clearly defined as we've already discussed. Now why didn't then China react initially when the Dollar Big Oldie Road was being built or being opened? I'm, I'm asking you questions because I don't understand what was the provocation. So you say it's not just limited tactical gains. I, I'm quoting your interview with Suhasini Haider, which was published in, in the Hindu. I, I think if, if I remember correctly, it was the 11th of July. Correct. Now, mm -hmm. now, you said it's not just limited tactical gains. One, four, five, eight kilometers. 
So it's a far bigger political and a diplomatic act. That's what you say. That, that just some local military tactical gain. Now, strengthening of ties, not just with China, what I mean, you have suggested that this could be sending also messages to our own neighbors and not just Pakistan to Bangladesh. We've seen a more belligerent Nepal to Sri Lanka that the message being that you can't re rely on India, that India can't even take care of its own territory. And you've also alluded to older issues, South China Sea. Uh, China's policy, according to you, has been two steps for, you know, forward and then you take one step backward and, and you sort of make it out as if it's, it's, a, it's a victory and, and you yourself are sort of talking about why, whereas both sides, India and China, the government strategic communications, according to you, has been abysmal, spins, leaks, motivated articles. But nevertheless, we are really at a juncture when we don't really know what, what are the lessons that we have to learn. I mean, is, is China saying, you know, you can walk away with a propaganda victory? That's all you think it's, it, it, it remains uh, smoke and mirrors, spin propaganda all the way? But right now, I think we're still in the middle of the crisis. So I don't think we can today say, you know, oh, it's been done. This is what happened. Secondly, if we focus entirely on what is China's motive, why has China done this? You will always be guessing. Chinese are not going to tell you what they actually think. They don't open their archives. So even 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you're not likely to have a conclusive answer to that. You will only come to a certain general understanding based on watching their behavior and what they actually say in the negotiations, what they seek to keep, what they seek, what they give up as part of the negotiation. That will give you some sense of why they did this. Uh, and all that we don't know yet. So I think, frankly, it's too early to answer that question today. All I said was, if you look at the pattern of Chinese behavior in other cases, and even with us in the recent past, then I think you, we need to be careful of a situation where the Chinese take, as I said, two steps forward and then offer one step back and everybody is happy and goes home. For instance, we have agreed now, apparently, uh, according to the media, to a disengagement all along the line. Now, that's a very useful first step because it prevents clashes which might escalate uh, and could become outright conflict. So disengagement is useful, but it's only a first step because uh, ultimately what we have been seeking and what we have always sought when there have been Chinese intrusions is a restoration of the status quo as it was before because the commitment in the 1993 agreement is to maintaining the status quo, irrespective of how clear or undefined or defined the LAC is or whether we agree on where it is, the commitment is to maintaining the status quo. In okay. other words, you might have different opinions on where the LAC is in a particular spot, but that doesn't give you the right to change the situation on the ground. And therefore, that is what we should ultimately be aiming for. But even if you obtain the restoration of the status quo, that does, you can just ignore what's happened all this. If this happened, how did we respond? All that we need to look at, study, and answer the questions that you asked, but we can't do it today, not in the middle of the crisis. We don't have enough knowledge, and certainly sitting outside, you and I don't have enough knowledge to do this. Okay, now I want to contrast the statement that has been attributed to you in the Hindu, where you actually say it's dangerous in today's at today at this pres at the present juncture to talk about disengagement pullback withdrawal buffer zones at this particular point of time and i want you to comment specifically on prime minister narendra modi's statement made to members of various political parties, a so-called all-party meeting on the 19th of June. And I quote him. And, and by the way, this little bit is not available so easily on his website, but he made it in public. It's been shown on television. And he said in Hindi, Na kohi waha hamara seema mein ghus aya hai, na hi koi ghusa hua hai, na hi hamari koi post 
किसी दूसरे के कब्जे में है Loosely translated to me, neither has anybody intruded into our territory, nor have any of our posts been captured. And then the Chinese were pleased as punch with this statement. What do you make of uh, Mr. Modi's statement? You know, I, on the first part of your question about it's dangerous, I said if the Chinese have pushed forward along the LAC and we then only do disengagement buffer zones and so on, then we are already negotiating at a disadvantage. We are then actually creating buffer zones, disengaging in territory, which has always been under our control. And that's why I consider that dangerous. That's not the same as restoring the status quo. And so that was the, that, so actually you have to see that dangerous within a context. And I, what I was saying is, if this has happened, then this is not enough. It's not enough to insist on just disengagement or, or buffer zones. And I do think that we should still be pushing for uh, restoring the status quo, though it will take a lot of time. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight. And it can take, in Sundarong Chu, it took you know, over seven years to actually achieve a change which was acceptable to us. On Prime Minister Modi's statement, I think you know, there was then a clarification the next day by the PMO saying that what he said applied only to Galwan. And there have been subsequent statements by NEA and so on. None of us is in any position to either confirm, deny, whatever the accuracy of what he says. I presume that if it's only applied to Galwan, and then that it may have been accurate at the time he said it, whether it's still accurate, who knows. And I really think that at this stage, when you are in the middle of a negotiation with the Chinese, uh, Chinese will use anything they can. They will use it in whatever form they, they can do. And Global Times, therefore, is, you know, and that's Global Times' purpose in life. It is an external propaganda organ. It's, it's not read in China, it's written in English, and it's written for you and me to influence opinion abroad. Uh, but uh, the fact that they use something or not, that is neither here nor there. I think more important, and this brings me back to what I said earlier, is that there needs to be better strategic communication between government and the Indian people. Uh, I'm sure that in the negotiation with the Chinese, they're probably very clear, but they need to, to be clear about what's happening and about what we are trying to do with our own people so that, you know, rumor, misinformation, misinterpretation, all this stops. Otherwise, it becomes a party political football kicked around, and the truth is the first casualty then. Uh, I actually think it helps the government in its negotiation with the Chinese if it were more open with our own people. Uh, because it also can make clear to the Chinese what the red lines are in the negotiation. Uh, but that's something that, frankly, government has to decide. Mr. Menon, I'm actually going back to a question that I asked you because I want you to elaborate on it. Uh, you, or like all good diplomats, you said India's relations with one country is never exclusive of India's relations with other countries. In this case, it may be Russia, it may be China. But Did I say that? Something to that effect. I mean, all diplomats say it. Uh, you, you want me to give you a more exact quote of yours? <laughs> no, I, I'm surprised that I said that. Anyway. No, no. no the, the word you use is, it's never been binary. The word you use is binary. Yeah. U.S., Russia, U.S., China, you know, you know that kind of thing. Not either or choice. In Absolutely. Fact, I'm correct. saying the opposite. I'm saying that you can actually have relationships with all of them at the same time. Okay. No, I'm, I'm sort of stepping back a little bit to go back to a question that I asked you because I have to explore two other themes with you at a later point of time. That's trade and defense equipment. But before that... The fact is, Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping have met 18 times after Mr. Modi became Prime Minister in 2014. They had one-on-one -on -one meetings at Wuhan, April 2018. They at uh, Mahabalipuram, October 2019. They sat on the swing on the banks of the Sabarmati. And some commentators are drawing parallels between what happened 
Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Chow and Lai, Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai, followed by a war. And I go back to the question I asked: What is the meaning of what are the what is the meaning of these words? Non-alignment, non-alignment version two, strategic autonomy. And I go back to the question: Does the perception that India has a pro-U.S. stance vis-a-vis -vis China? Does it or does it not dimin diminish or destroy our own strategic autonomy? So there are really two parts to this question. Yes. Well, firstly, I you said you know are we back in what happened in the late fifties, the leading up to the war? My own sense right now is that all three options are possible. That uh, India-China relations could either go like they did from 86 to 88. 86, the Chinese came into Sundaram Chu, sat there. We had a crisis on the border, which we dealt with both militarily, diplomatically, and we declared Arunachal as a state, uh, granted statehood to Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, finally, Rajiv Gandhi went. We started a dialogue with the Chinese. Rajiv Gandhi went. In 88 December, we created a new framework for the relationship, which worked for more than 30 years. Uh, or else it could go the way 59 to 62, a steady downward spiral where public opinion gets more and more agitated, the media, uh, parliament being for, you know, uh, retaliation, etc. And third option, of course, that we sort of muddled through. A more adversarial relationship, no war, no peace, a sort of, and we deal with the individual issues, but overall a much harder relationship between India and China. Uh, so right now in the middle of a crisis, I think it's too early to say which way we're going. Clearly, I mean, I don't think that the downward spiral is a very good way to go, but there's always a risk of that. I and mean, you can't minimize human folly, unfortunately. Uh, but I do think, and I do think that a reset is called for in the relationship, and this involves both sides actually agreeing about it. The, what about strategic autonomy? You know, it, every government of India, by one name or another, has basically followed a policy of ensuring that we are not strategically entangled, that we decide on issues on their merits and how they affect India's enlightened self-interest, and that we have the freedom to make that choice. That is why we've stayed out of alliances, because alliances commit you beforehand to certain choices, and alliances where they involve more than two or three parties actually result in a collective decision, which you will then have to follow because you're an ally. And so whether you call it non-alignment, genuine non-alignment, or strategic autonomy, basically, all governments of India, including the present one, have followed a similar policy. They, that hasn't stopped us from cooperating in defense, in intelligence, in security, in maritime security, counterterrorism, on all these things with whichever partners we find to work with. Uh, and, I mean, it doesn't, at the height of the Cold War, we were buying fighter aircraft from, from the Soviet Union and from France. Uh, so, for me, that's strategic autonomy, being able to take the decision yourself. And I think that is still true of us. Now, we started transforming our relationship with the U.S. when the Chinese had a much deeper relationship with the U.S. than we did. In fact, the Chinese worked together with the U.S. virtually as allies, whether it was in the war in Afghanistan against the Soviets, Right through the 70s, 80s, and uh, most of the 90s, the Chinese actually worked very closely. It was just after the collapse of the Soviet Union that that glue in their relationship went down. But you look at the quality of the Chinese-US economic relationship. I mean, it's orders of magnitude bigger and deeper than anything that we have enjoyed with the US. Okay. So it can't be, it can't be that or the transformation of India-US relations is the trigger for Chinese actions. No, it should not be. It's different if you are talking about a situation where there is actually an actual China-US conflict, but we're far from that today. Okay. Today, their relations are more contentious, but it's not a question. We don't have to choose between them. 
Okay. We have relations with both and we work both. That's what I said when I said it's not binary. Okay. It's so, not either or. We'll talk about that trade war, US-China trade war, India-China uh, India trade, uh, or whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, investment trade, the problems and, 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 and the differences. But let's come to one special, specific point which you referred to on purchase of aircraft, purchase of defense equipment. In your interview uh, to the Hindu, you said that the, in, the US has a law, it has an act which says that if you buy weapons from Russia, they can you know, impose all kinds of penalties and sanctions, but they haven't applied this to India. And, and th there is a common interest and Russia is still a major source uh, of military equipment for us. And, and it's not that we can suddenly decouple from Russia and why should we? Russia has been a reliable, trusted friend, etc., etc. So I think I do think that one consequence of what we've seen happening in Ladakh and the whole reset of India-China will be stronger India-Russia relations as well. In fact, our defense minister, Mr. Rajnath Singh, in the middle of all this crisis, the, the only major country he went to was, in fact, Moscow. I mean, the only major visit he made. Now, I'm asking you a slightly bigger question. What does this imply? Greater dependence on the West for military equipment vis-a-vis -vis Russia, including Israel. When I say West, I include Israel. And what does this mean for Mr. Modi saying Atma Nirbhar Bharat? self-sufficiency in defense equipment. I mean, it has been argued that the manner in which India bought the, the, the Des, um, uh, Rafale aircraft from Dassault was a blow, a huge blow to Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. I mean, we hear this government going headlong into privatization, including privatization of defense equipment. Now, what does this mean? What are the implications that of what has been happening in the recent past? Your views, please. On uh, our dependence on imports for our weapons platforms and for our defense equipment, I mean, that's something that I think should worry all of us. And I think that is an area where we certainly need to be self-reliant, where Atmanir Bharata is really the goal that we should be working for. But it's not a goal that anyone has found possible overnight. Our, actually, if you look at the proportion of our dependence on imports for our defense supplies, that's actually diminished over time. But it's still unacceptably high. Uh, and the source of our major platforms is still Russia. Uh, but we have diversified sources of supply. We now get weapons, weapons and defense equipment from the US as well, from other, as you said, Israel, from other, other partners. Uh, but I think what we are seeing increasingly is that even though we might be getting equipment from abroad, we will try and make sure that it's made in India, that the technologies also come to India. Now, whether it is public or private, frankly, it, that's an efficiency decision. If the private sector is more efficient in providing this in India, Good luck to them. And I think that we should, that is a decision that we should take on our own, which is separate. I don't think that privatization or frankly using public sector, uh, especially, you know, the ordnance factories to do uh, consumer goods, for instance, that made no sense. And we've moved out of that. We've moved away from that in the past. Uh, if you look at the example of our space program, it is fed today essentially by a whole series of private companies and firms who not only have the technology, but also compete among themselves. And I think that kind of ecosystem, if we can build in India, where public sector, private sector, but internal competition to promote efficiencies in defense equipment supplies and production, I think that's really the way to go. No, but uh, the uh, question, the question now, I had, sir, and I'm interrupting you here, is that whether this is actually happening or are we it is or are it we is in the process of this is why weakening, I said, weakening no, companies happening. in the HAL? If That is why I said that if you look at the proportion of imports in our total equipment supplies, defense equipment supplies, it's actually going down over time. And that's a long-term secular trend over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, that proportion has reduced over time. 
but it's a slow process and it needs to be accelerated considerably. Okay, I, I, I want to know your views about what has been happening on the trade front. You've talked about uh, US China trade relations being very strange. Some people say this is a new third world war, uh, you know, except that it's not being fought with guns and missiles and bombs, it's being fought by trade, it's being fought, uh, the fight is on issues like related to information technology. But that's not it alone. I mean, look, as far as India is concerned, that nobody should have any illusions as who's going to get hurt if hypothetically we stop all trade with China. You know, we've already placed restrictions on investments and it's not just a question of banning, you know, 59 computer applications like TikTok. The fact is India's imports from China comprise barely 3% of China's total exports. India's uh, exports to China account for less than 1% of China's total imports. But for India, it's very important. And let me just flag one issue, and there are many issues in this, active pharmaceutical ingredients. 70% of our total active pharmaceutical ingredients that are used by India's pharmaceutical companies are imported from China. Now, now and, and that includes 100% of particular certain life-saving drugs, including paracetamol, including ibuprofen, so, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, stop Chinese trade, don't buy their LED bulbs, don't buy their Modi masks, don't buy their kite flying manja, etc., etc. But the issues are really very, very deep. And I mean, I mean and, and at a time when the world and India and China and all of us are going through this unprecedented healthcare crisis, the pandemic, uh, there are very, very major implications of this so called trade standoff? Well, two things. I, you know, you started by saying trade war. I think, unfortunately, we now cheapen the word war to use it for everything. We have a war on terror, war on COVID, trade war, everything. But for me, this is worrying because this suggests a whole militarization of the way we think. War is not a joke. And certainly these are not wars. These might be struggles, they might be, you know, you, there are other words. And I think we need to find more accurate ways of dealing with this, of describing this. Because if you start thinking of it as a war, you start coming up with the wrong solutions. Then there are victors, losers, etc. You impose your will. Uh, and I think the whole context changes. With India-China, obviously, these, it is an unsatisfactory economic relationship that we have with China. The, the imbalance is really far too great, over $56 billion dollars last year, uh, out of a total of about $93 billion total two-way trade. Uh, you said that we account for only 3% of China's exports, but we also, that accounts for, that $56 billion accounts for, I was corrected by somebody, 16% of China's surplus. So that does constitute a certain amount of leverage. Uh, and... I think what's happened now gives us a chance as part of the reset to rejig the economic relationship into something that works better. We have had some success, especially in the last six years, in attracting Chinese investment in India. Almost about 26% of uh, 26 billion US dollars worth of Chinese investment came in. 2014 total cumulative Chinese investment was only about $1.8 billion. Uh, and most of that actually in startups, in fintech, in, uh, in actually uh, software, other companies, and in startups like Zomato and so on. But a lot of our payments, digital payment systems, for instance, depend not just on Chinese investment, but on Chinese technologies. Famous, not all of it depends. Famous to P2M. A, P2M, all of them, and most of them. So we do have dependencies, power equipment, Telecom equipment, APIs, you said, 68%. Uh, so pharma, uh, there is a whole set of dependencies. What I would expect is, frankly, that on consumer goods, it depends on the Indian consumer's appetite and willingness to pay more for alternates and to actually put his money where his mouth is and to stop buying Chinese goods. And that is something that you can't predict. Whether this is purely a price-sensitive market or not, that's something else. 
But there are areas where I think government has a major say, telecom, and especially where these dependencies have been created or have grown over the years. I think those are areas where you will probably see government intervention. Uh, already, you mentioned government has already put in uh, prior approval for investment from China. But how do you work this in a globalized world where, frankly, capital is fungible? I mean, no, no, you, you talk about anywhere. telecom equipment. I mean, let, let's be specific. You know, Huawei and, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the Z company, they monopolize certain kinds of telecom equipment, not just in India, across the world. No, but I think what you can do in telecom is very simple. You don't try and protect everything. There are things where you only build in resilience, but you protect your core interests in these networks. Until, you know, 2016, I think it was, uh, even Cisco routers were all made in China. So as you, this is a globalized world where you have to build your own defenses and decide what to defend and choose which bits to harden, which bits where you will learn to live with some disruption and build in resilience so that knowing that people will attack these systems, things will happen, you can still go on. Uh, so there are ways around this problem. And I think we will find them. And, you know, I'm in this area, actually, I'm less worried because there is enough Indian know-how, ingenuity and capability, especially in telecoms and so on. Now, electronics is an area where there's a huge dependence on things from China, auto parts. And some of these are original equipment manufacturers. You know, let's say Mercedes-Benz building cars in India, importing from their plant in China. Those kinds of things will not stop because they're not going to cut their global supply chains just to suit your sentiment. Uh, so what I foresee is a mixed picture. There's never going to be a complete decoupling. There will be some rejigging of the relationship and certainly the parts which are amenable to government control and, and, and management, those parts I think will, will be redone as part of Atmanirbhar Bharat. But Atmanibhar self-reliance doesn't mean that you do everything 100% yourself. All right. It means that you have the choice and you have options. Okay. And that's, I think, the situation we need to work to. We are more than 45 minutes into our conversation, Mr. Menon. This is positively my last question to you. And in a sense, I'm going back to where we started, looking at the big, bigger geopolitical picture. And I say you are uh, placed in a situation where... Uh, given your long years of experience, uh, not just as a national security advisor, but as, as a diplomat and as a person who's dealt uh, with issues like uh, public policy or national security, disarmament and so on and so forth, India's relations. Let's look at the bigger picture once again. And, and we know we are not happy with the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, we, we're looking at the claims, the counterclaims, not just on Aksai Jin and Gilgit Baltistan and Arunachal Pradesh. But India was the only major Asian country that opposed the Belt and Road Initiative. And, you know, the, the, the movement to the warm water ports, the Gwadar, to Kashgar. You know, what I'm here saying is that we're seeing what's happening in Iran, Bangladesh, that submarine... Uh, uh, port in, 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 that, in, in the Chittagong and, and Cox's Bazar area, Sri Lanka, the port in Sri Lanka, China's famous string of pearls all the way from the South China Sea to the Horn of Africa. So when you talk about the reset of India-China relations, where do you go from here? And, and you have, and I, and I quote you here what you just said, that there is a distinct possibility and you cannot rule out a return to the situation that prevailed in the late 50s and in the early 60s where we move downwards from here. That the, that the spiral, the India-China relations move downward from here. So I would like you to make your... My own sense is that the least likely outcome of the crisis from my point of view is the downward spiral. Yes. Uh, more likely for me is a positive outcome with a new framework for the relationship, a reset. But most likely is actually muddling through with a more adversarial sort of no war, no peace kind of relationship. But 
you mentioned the neighborhood and China's increasing role in our neighbors, her increased commitment to Pakistan, her purchase or involvement in ports around the Indian Ocean. Uh, all that certainly matters. And it is a material change in the situation that we have to deal with. But I don't think we should underestimate our own capabilities and interests. In, within the subcontinent, for instance, our affinities are very strong. And we need to work. We need to step up our game, no question. But what we need to work for is a much closer integration economically of the countries of the subcontinent. And this makes sense from our own in point of view. And we need to make sure that India is seen by them as a source of stability and security in the subcontinent and in the extended neighborhood, the Indian Ocean region. And that, I think, involves much more engagement, uh, not less, not a drawing inwards, not a cutting off of our links with the rest of the world. So my larger answer to this new situation, to the more assertive China, to what we are facing now would be strengthen ourselves, Atmanirbharta, yes, certainly, but integrate the neighborhood, work, do much more in our extended neighborhood, and do external balancing with, work with the powers who also have interests like you in maritime security throughout the Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific, whatever you want to call it, whether it's Russia, whether it's Iran, whether it's the US, Japan, Australia, work with Indonesia, Singapore, Vietnam. I mean, the list of partners available to you is huge. I have a mantra which I use over and over again, is do issue-based coalitions of the willing. I mean, this is, it's hard work. It's very hard work. But you've done it in other cases. You did a solar alliance, for instance. And it, the partners you work with will vary depending on the issue. But pick an issue, say, whether it's maritime security or whether it's counterterrorism, and, and find partners who share your interests and have the willingness and capability to do something about it. I am not, I am an optimist. I actually think that every crisis creates opportunities, gives you a chance to change unsatisfactory realities. And I think we have another such opportunity today, actually. We've heard that before, sir, but time alone will tell whether your optimism is ground in reality, whether the muddling through of India-China relations, which you say is a very likely possibility, the no war, no peace kind of a scenario, where that will take us. So on behalf of all the viewers of News Critic, thank you very, very much for giving us your valuable time and, and sharing uh, uh, your views on a host of issues that uh, me, a novice, I, I barely understand international relations, I, 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 uh, I was That's clearly not true. No, no, thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you very much. So I stopped the recording now, sir. Thank you. And, and, and do keep watching News Click.